Hello and welcome to F110 Autonomous Racing. My name is Madhur Bahel and I will be your instructor for this course. The world of autonomous vehicles and in particular autonomous racing is literally and figuratively very fast moving. And so I'm very pleased to offer this course again this semester to introduce you to both foundational ideas and the latest research in this area. In this course, you will learn about the principles of perception, planning, and control for autonomous vehicles while focusing on a very exciting autonomous racing application, hence the name of the course. I'm a professor in computer science and in systems engineering at the University of Virginia, and I work at the Cyber Physical Systems Link Lab, where my group conducts research at the intersection of artificial intelligence, robotics, cyber physical systems, and autonomous systems. In today's lecture, I just want to give you an overview of what to expect in this course, who is it meant for, what all topics are we going to cover, answer questions such as what even is F110, and then just to set your expectations and my expectations uh, as an instructor. We will give you a brief topic and an assortment of both research and uh, uh, curriculum associated with this course. And then in the end, I will also share uh, a brief summary of some of the activities here at uh, UVA uh, centered around autonomous racing. So let me give you a very high level idea of what is F110. This is an example of a F1 by 10 autonomous racing vehicle. It's a 110 scale autonomous race car, as you can see. Uh, it's very similar to full scale race cars and we'll go into a little bit deep into what those connections are, but you can see it has uh, a lot of different uh, perception or sensors in terms of a camera, a LiDAR, uh, an IMU or a, a, a gyro. Um, then it has uh, electronic speed controller to control the drive motor and the steering servo. It has an onboard computer, which is GPU enabled, which does all the compute and doesn't require any signals from anywhere. Uh, it's a standalone autonomous vehicle. And based around this idea of building this vehicle, F110 is much more beyond just the physical prototype. It's actually a community of researchers, enthusiasts, and students, much like yourself, uh, who build these vehicles and then use them uh, for learning, for, for competition, and for their own research. The good thing about the F110 ecosystem is that it, it spans a lot of different um, canonical core concepts, such as you know mechanical chassis design or how everything is put together. There's some thought gone to that. There's obviously systems design or mechatronics angle to it where you have to uh, interface all these sensors, make sure you're getting their data correctly at the right rates, it's all time synchronized. Um, there's the software part, which is a, going to be a big component of uh, this particular course to teach you how the autonomous vehicle and the autonomous race car actually works and how do you use all this data uh, to make racing decisions. And then finally, there's the frontier of racing or autonomous vehicles, where we use these prototypes to enable uh, high impact research in a very, very accessible manner that anybody could replicate in their lab. And you don't need a, a full scale car to, to test out these ideas. So here are just some examples of many, many uh, research projects that uh, the contributors from the F110 community have, have done in recent years. Uh, they range from reactive methods such as follow the gap, and don't worry if you don't know what these methods are right now. Uh, that's the whole idea of the course. By the end of this course, you will know everything on the slide. Um, there are more uh, nuanced approaches such as model predictive control, which are predictive rather than reactive. There's neural networks and deep learning, uh, and you can use the F110 car to try out those ideas uh, and have your car drive by uh, outputs from a deep neural network. If you have multiple vehicles, you can try ideas of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle collaboration or vehicle-to-interface uh, in infrastructure or V2X, as they call it, uh, uh, setups. And th those can be tried with our uh, cohort of uh, F110 vehicles as well. Then you can do some more traditional approaches such as lane keep assist. So given two lines, can you just have your car center and drive down the line like many uh, full-scale uh, self-driving car prototypes can do all the time. Uh, there's computer vision part of it. So you can take a scene, you can do segmentation, optical flow, 
Uh, many, many different ideas from computer vision can also be tried on the 110 scale. There's localization and mapping, and that's going to be a dedicated module in this course where we will teach you how do self-driving cars create maps of the world using their own sensors, and then given a map, how do they even localize uh, within that map. In fact, you'll get a flavor of localization and mapping uh, in this very first lecture in just a bit. Finally, there's a simulator that we have made. It's in ROS, uh, and specifically it's in Gazebo. Gazebo is an environment or a simulation environment uh, which is compatible with ROS. Uh, and since this course is being offered online, instead of relying on the physical prototypes, we will heavily rely on uh, such simulators. And we'll uh, go into a little bit more detail in a bit. And then for those of you who are more from the computer science world uh, of things, you can even you know inspect and use this uh, platform for your own research, whether that has to do with real-time scheduling, and giving assurances of whether processes finish on time and software inspection, uh, looking at you know, fault detection in software and things like that, uh, all the way to doing behavioral verification and testing. So making sure that the autonomous vehicle is always safe and the decisions it makes um, can be guaranteed to be safe, which is a very hard challenge. So as I said, F110 is a large, large community. It's an effort which was started almost uh, five to six years ago now. And since then, there's more than 80 universities and institutions uh, across the globe uh, who have used our open source F110 materials to build their own prototypes, uh, and they do research or they participate in a competition. So they span many, many universities uh, across the globe, and this is not an exhaustive uh, list that I'm presenting you. So this is in a nutshell, is extremely like, you know, the very high level view. We'll go into a little bit into the weeds uh, uh, in this uh, overview lecture. But before that, let me go over some of the boilerplate logistic stuff because that is important as well. And since this year the course is being offered uh, in a completely virtual manner, it becomes all the more important to emphasize how things are going to be organized. All right, so, so as, as indicated, uh, both the lecture and the lab sessions for this course this semester are going to be in an online asynchronous manner. Uh, which means that there is no fixed time per week where you have to convene and listen to a live lecture. Um, me and the TAs, we will upload the content for the week, uh, usually distributed either on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, but we might deviate from that sometimes. But we will always upload the full content of the week in a, in a manner which is you know, easily consumable by you. Uh, in an online asynchronous manner. And this will happen through both the course website and uh, CoLab, which you all should have access to by now. Uh, Piazza should be set up as well. This would be used as a forum, as you are all familiar with, for a discussion, uh, to post questions and uh, you know your doubts or any problems uh, you can discuss among each other and with me and the TAs on Piazza. Uh, you don't have to buy any dedicated textbook for this course. All the course content is self-contained and you will mostly rely on uh, code repositories, lecture slides and video lectures, video demonstrations uh, to see you through the entire semester. Uh, speaking of which, we will have access to uh, GitHub repository, which will be shared soon, as soon as the first assignment is released. And uh, everybody will have access to template codes, which will be shared uh, using GitHub. I'm very grateful to have Rockstar TAs helping me out to organize and transition to this online format for this course. Uh, this course is so hands-on in the previous semesters that it took a lot of creativity and thinking to offer a meaningful version of the course in an online setting. So your lead TA is Jin Yun Ning. He is a PhD candidate in computer engineering um, who was working on a lot of AI algorithms at the intersection of machine learning and control uh, with application to autonomous vehicles and smart cities. And Varun Dev Suresh Babu is our in-house F110 expert. Uh, it is, uh, he is one of the original designers of the chassis and many of the, uh, the code repositories has been created by him. He's also the developer of the F110 ROS simulator uh, that we will be using for this semester. So I'm very glad he's on board to help us out. Um, and together, Jinyun and, Ning, uh, Jinyun, Jinyun and Varun Dev together uh, are going to be available and they will share their office hours uh, on Piazza shortly. 
If you want to reach me directly, I have a, a recurring office hours online on Collab. These are not my generic office hours. These are meant to be specific to this course. Um, so the link to attending these office hours can be found via the course Collab webpage. Um, outside of these hours, if you want to reach me and discuss any problems that you are facing or if something is not clear, uh, you can always feel free to email me directly outside of these hours and we can maybe set up a time uh, to chat. All right, so, so this is the main course webpage. This is kind of your one-stop shop for everything related to the F110 course. Uh, this is like a different version or a UVA specific version of the F110 uh, material, which is tailored towards this virtual um, uh, F110 simulator this semester. So, so keep note of this uh, URL. This is also going to be posted on the Collab webpage and on Piazza as well. And we will basically use this webpage to uh, share all the slide decks, all the lab handouts and uh, assignments as well. And then, um, you know, accompanying this course webpage is the overall f110.org webpage. Though this view of the page is a little dated. If you visit the site, it looks so much uh, polished than what I'm showing you right now. Uh, but f110.org is the main website uh, where you know anybody can go and learn how these cars are built, driven, and race. Um, and then you know uh, it has a lot of other lectures which are more advanced available on that webpage as well. You are always free to refer to the main f110.org webpage as well. But uh, like I said, the the benefit of having a more compressed and tailored format. Uh, is through this course, which is UVA specific. And so we take into account the background of the students and we tailor our, uh, our topics and content based on that. So feel free to visit the, the main webpage as well and at least take a look around to appreciate uh, how much effort has gone into making this project successful and open source. Very quick overview of the kind of topics that we will cover. I don't really like to dwell on these type of lists for too long, but I will give you a little bit of flavor, at least in terms of a, a process or what to expect in terms of topics to be covered. So you can you know, relate it to other courses you may have taken here or elsewhere. So we will spend a, a good amount of time in this course to teach you ROS. ROS is called Robot Operating System. I will explain a little bit about what ROS is uh, in a few slides, uh, but a lot of the initial uh, few weeks are dedicated to just teach you ROS because we don't assume that you know ROS and there's no prerequisite to know ROS uh, in this course. Uh, once we have covered that, there will be a, a dedicated set of weeks to introduce you to the F110 simulator. And while that happens, we will also start introducing all these uh, foundational topics such as you know algorithms for perception, for mapping, for localization, for control. Then we slowly go into path planning. We will look at reactive methods such as wall following, and then uh, you know slowly advance that to high level trajectory planning, obstacle avoidance, static collision avoidance, dynamic collision avoidance, advanced topics in racing, head to head racing and racing strategy. So, uh, so it's a pretty dense and fast pace. I keep saying that, uh, pun intended, but it is true. It's a very fast paced course and therefore, you know, there's a lot of information, relevant information, which is to be packaged, but at the same time, it's arranged in a very logical manner that uh, you'll be able to progress along. So in a nutshell, the lab sessions or the lab exercises, they are organized as if it was a racing weekend. Instead of a weekend, it's an entire semester though. So again, you know, the first few sessions at the lab exercises are to evaluate your understanding in ROS, to demonstrate that you uh, know how it works, and you can you know write basic ROS nodes. Uh, then we will gradually go into controlling your uh, simulated F110 vehicle using ROS, uh, using the sensors from the simulator, driving in a straight line, showing emergency braking, and then we'll up the ante, going into practice session three and practice session four, uh, which are qualifying and racing. Uh, where you have to complete multiple laps, you have to complete laps with obstacles, and then finally you have to complete laps with other vehicles on the track at the same time. All right, so now comes the, the most important part, I think, of what you are waiting for, which is how are you being graded and you know what do you need to do to do well in the course. So I have uh, good news and bad news. The, 
The good news is there is no exam in this course, right? This is a special topics class. There is no midterm, there is no final exam. Uh, the final grade of this course will be determined on the basis of how well you do on individual assignments, which will have some kind of a weekly or bi-weekly cadence. Uh, and then also how you do uh, together as a team, right? Because down the course, when when you have to race other, other cars, um, you will be organized into groups and you will program your car as a group and then you will race against other other teams which will have the exact same simulated car. So the only distinguishing factor would be the algorithms, right? So I don't know whether that's good or a bad thing. Do people prefer exams or, or do, they, do they prefer just uh, weekly uh, assignments? But that's what we are going with. Um, and so the, there is no final exam. The final exam is an autonomous race between all the teams. In terms of prerequisites, I try to uh, put down whatever I think is, is necessary to succeed in this course and to more importantly, you know, take all the concepts with you uh, for this course. Because I'm a big believer that although, you know, you might, you might not be well versed in all of these topics, but if the gap is huge, then you will be always playing this uh, game of uh, you know, catching up and building your background while the course is also progressing and we are teaching you new topics. And so sometimes it's very difficult to manage both, especially if there's a lot of things to catch up. Therefore, I think it's easier to just spell out uh, what kind of is expected that you would know. Um, so let's start with, you know, to succeed in this course, I, I do think students should know and have a good foundation in linear algebra, a little bit of calculus. So we're not talking about very complicated calculus, but just, you know, what is a ordinary differential equation? So single variable calculus. Uh, we'll be using a lot of linear algebra though. So matrix manipulations, um, they are canonical to robotics, to all these ideas of mapping, localization, perception. Uh, so you really need to know your matrices and arrays and vectors and how to compute angles between them and how to rotate things in Euclidean space and things like that. We will also rely on some ideas from probability and statistics. So uh, I think most of you would have seen some sort of statistics by now, but uh, we will do, you know, we will rely on some ideas from, from probability. So when I say things like, you know, this is a normal random variable, uh, if that doesn't ring a bell, then that's a yellow flag. Okay, so you should know what is a Gaussian distribution and how uh, mathematically you use it and represent it, what is standard deviation, what is the mean variance, things like that. In terms of programming, uh, what we really require is a, a, a sort of well-versed and an intermediate programming skill in Python. So this shouldn't be your, your first or even second programming course. Uh, most of the nodes we will write and the simulator uses Python. There is some C++ if you have to do computer vision parts, but we'll get to that later. But, uh, but in terms of like a background, I think intermediate Python really has to cover it. So I'm not going to teach Python in this course uh, at all. Also, I require that students uh, are very comfortable using Linux and Ubuntu and command line and um, shell scripts as well. So, you know, if you don't, if you have never used Ubuntu as an operating system, this is probably not the course for you. Um, and I didn't mean to say just specifically Ubuntu, I meant Linux in general. But you need to know, you know, basic uh, file manipulation and uh, handling, um, how to SSH, uh, we won't use that too much because we won't be, uh, you know, um, getting access to the real cars. More things about process management. Uh, you need to know uh, about GitHub and how that interfaces and things like that. So, so uh, we will be using Ubuntu as the main operating system on which ROS will be installed. That's why I expect you to know this. And then there's some some optional stuff as well, right? So 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 this should give you a good idea. But just to summarize, uh, kind of the expectation from my end is that if you are enrolled and you are serious about uh, taking this course this semester, you do need to have some maturity in uh, Python programming or programming in general, in linear algebra and in calculus and statistics or probability. You should know Linux very well, command line especially, and then you know you should know GitHub. Um, 
all the optional stuff is computer vision, machine learning, deep learning. It's This is not really a course which is focused on any one of those topics, but if you have seen those topics, it will help you in this course, at least in the, in the deeper portions of the semester. Um, yeah, what I want to say is that, you know, this shouldn't be intimidating, but at the same time, just be real to yourself. So if you think you don't have the correct background, you can always come back another semester. This course is not going anywhere. It's a pretty popular course. It will be offered uh, every spring semester. And uh, finally, this is more of like a disclaimer, but I think uh, expectation should be set uh, from the beginning. This is a special topics course. As you know, it has been listed as a special topics course. And I just want to clarify what that means. It doesn't mean that you know we'll, we'll be just winging it on the go. All it means is this is an advanced class, and so we often adjust uh, you know, how much emphasis to give on what topic, which assignments to give more time to, which assignments to give less time to. So all these little tweaks and adjustments do happen on the fly based on how the students respond. And so we may make adjustments along the way. Okay, so this should clarify uh, any, if not all, doubts you have uh, on prerequisites and whether or not you have the right background to take this course. I often think it's also helped to, it helps to say what this course is not, right? So uh, I've told you what this might be about, but this is list is about what this course is not going to be about. So this is not a mechatronics class, especially this sem, uh, because there is no physical car. We are using an online simulator. This is not a substitution for a computer vision or a deep learning class, because we will touch the surface of these just in the context of where they are useful in our AV uh, pipeline but we won't go deep into deep learning. Um, this shouldn't be your you know, first or second programming course. You will be required to write thousands of lines of code uh, along the way. And so if you haven't done large scale coding projects, um, you, know, you, need to, uh, you need to think about whether this is the right time to take this course or not. Uh, and so finally, you know, this, this is not a replacement for any semester long courses and that we are covering. There could be uh, you know, a course on its own, which is just for deep learning and perception for self-driving. There could be a course just on mapping, which is semester long as well. So, uh, so I want to cover the entire pipeline so that you walk away with the comfortable feeling of knowing how a self-driving car works, but that doesn't mean we have covered everything in, the, in, the, in all its detail, because this is a fast moving field. Uh, each one of these verticals, if you will, has a research frontier on its own. And yeah, so if you take all of this into account, this, this course uh, is a lot of fun, but certainly it will take a lot of time. So it's not super easy uh, to, to begin with. And so if you are taking this course, you know, be prepared to just allocate uh, a lot of time to the assignments, to the group work. Okay, let me touch upon this uh, very sensitive uh, subject of uh, waiting lists. Um, so traditionally, this course was limited uh, in terms of the enrollment because uh, we only had you know, 10 or 12 uh, of these uh, 110 scale vehicles to give out to the teams. Uh, and so that has carried over into this year's enrollment, even though there aren't any real vehicles to begin with, but we still have the enrollment capped to 48 students. I think part of it is also to do with how much the TAs can handle and in terms of the workload associated with setting up the simulator, grading, and what have you. All right, so this, this is a strict limit and I cannot change it uh, at will. Uh, and so for those of you who are on the waiting list, this is how I typically um, kind of accommodate this, this, uh, uh, this wait list. Uh, for the very for the few weeks until you have the um, add or drop deadline, uh, you will have access to all the resources as a enrolled student. But once that deadline passes, uh, I'm afraid if uh, you didn't get a chance to enroll, then you'll have to come back and take the course another time. Um, the website of the course is in public domain, so there's nothing uh, you know which is hidden from that. You can always go and look at uh, the exercises and the, the PDF of the lectures, uh, but the videos themselves, uh, they will be posted mostly to Colab, and uh, after the ad drop deadline, uh, you may lose access to it uh, if you are still on the waiting list. So think about think about uh, that you know from the get-go, that that is a possibility, especially if you are uh, very far behind in the waiting list. At the same time, uh, you know because I have explained the prerequisites and what kind of background is required, 
uh, it is not surprising for some students to uh, drop the course. And so there, you know, people in the waiting list can actually get a chance to enroll as well. So that is all I'm going to say about the wait list. Uh, if you email me directly asking me to bump you up, I'm afraid that's not something I can do. Uh, I know it's not an ideal situation. Ideally, we would want to have 100 students, but there's the real world um, pra you know, pragmatic reasons for, for this number to exist. And so we have to abide by it. Okay, so as I said, the, the main requirement for this course is that every single student must have access uh, to Ubuntu 18.04. Um, if you are not using Ubuntu 18.04 and you're using say 20.04 or you're not even using Ubuntu but some other uh, environment, um, then the only change is that you know we won't be supporting it, right? So if you face problems with installing stuff down the line, uh, it's not officially supported by the TAs and uh, and myself. So you're kind of left on your own to figure it out if you deviate from, from this recommendation. Uh, I would say, you know, that if you already have 20 or four, you can go ahead and stick with that for at least two thirds of the course. You won't have any problems. But if you don't have Ubuntu and you have to install it anyways, then I highly, highly recommend that you stick with the Bionic, which is 1804 long-term support. Um, if you don't know how to install Ubuntu, uh, actually that's a yellow flag again. Um, you shouldn't be enrolling if you don't know how to install Ubuntu or get access to it. But I'll give you some, some ideas and some suggestions. Um, if your main operating system obviously isn't Linux or Ubuntu, then you have to install a virtual machine. Uh, and there are options on both Windows and OS X or Mac. Uh, VirtualBox is a good free option, but it is known to uh, uh, sometimes you know make your make your virtual machine very slow. So you may have to figure out the right settings for it. Um, there's another option in Windows if you have access to a Windows Pro license. Then there's a native app called Hyper V, uh, which is uh, used for installing virtual machines. On Parallels, I highly recommend, although it's a paid software, that you get a, a one-year license or I don't know if a less uh, six duration, six month license is available, but Parallels works very smoothly on OS X uh, for any Ubuntu version. Uh, if you don't want to install a virtual machine uh, because you know it tends to slow down or it's not as fast as a native install, you can always dual boot your laptop, so you have a host laptop and Ubuntu as well. Um, and just be careful when you do that. They run the risk of uh, losing access to your original OS sometimes. Uh, and obviously the easiest way is to just have a dedicated machine with, uh, with Linux on it. And you do need pseudo privileges, so uh, I don't think you can just use some online Linux server unless you have pseudo permissions on that. Yeah, so, so there is no lab session this week, but uh, you know, if you are in this course, I expect you to have access to Ubuntu 18.04 uh, by the end of next week, right? So we'll be going right into ROS uh, and studying ROS and uh, into your first assignment very, very soon, like in uh, two weeks from now. So you definitely, definitely need access to 1804. And there's many online tutorials you can follow, so it's not worth uh, providing some kind of a YouTube video or a, or a PDF. I think you can figure it out how to get access to 1804. All right, so that was all the course logistics. Now let's get into the fun part of really going through what is F110. And in doing so, I'm gonna give you a quick flavor of both autonomous racing and F110 in particular, uh, but also a little bit about autonomous vehicles in general and what kind of perception planning and control principles can you expect to learn uh, from this offering. So I really like this hypothesis that uh, everything that moves today will eventually become autonomous, right? So we are already seeing this happen for many, many different kinds of systems, whether that's uh, ground vehicles or aerial vehicles, or even uh, we have autonomous maritime vessels now. Uh, so this transition, we are in the middle of it, right? This is no longer science fiction. We are living through this transition itself. So this, in my opinion, is the best time to be working in autonomous systems, and there's a huge appetite in the industry, uh, in the world, for uh, you know uh, engineers and researchers with the background who understand the intricacies of how these systems operate and how we can make them do really cool things. 
So since we are focused on autonomous vehicles, you know, the, the state of the art of autonomous vehicles is kind of uh, what you, the feeling that you get when you look at this picture, right? So you, the vision that we have is that you'll have this driverless car, uh, which won't have anybody inside. It'll come to you at the ping from an app. Uh, and then, you know, you can get inside, it'll drive you to where you have to go uh, and drop you off. And as simple as that, you know, uh, idly you won't have, even have to interact uh, with any human uh, throughout this process. And that's a really, really uh, challenging goal. Uh, and, you know, so, so, so in recent years, we have been making progress towards this uh, fully autonomous. It can drive anywhere from a random address in New York to a random address in Boston. Uh, without anybody having to touch the wheel, or maybe there is no wheel or you know traditional actuation in the car itself. So we are a while away from from that reality, but we are um, getting closer day by day. And so, if you don't know of this, there are, there are different levels of autonomous driving at which you you can um, measure the degree of autonomy uh, in that in that car. Right. So we begin with level zero where there is no autonomy at all. So you are, as a driver, responsible for all the tasks. And then we have level two, level three, where most of the commercial available uh, self-driving prototype packages, they fall in level two, some level three, where you know the vehicle has some kind of automated features, but the driver uh, always must be ready to take over control. So example, the Tesla Autopilot um, you know, is, is, is a good example of that. It's a pretty impressive system. It can change lanes, it can slow down, take the right exit. It can now even run in the city and detect stop signs and uh, all the different details relevant to traffic. But at the same time, you, know, you should be ready to take over control in the case uh, something unexpected happens. And so the goal is on the right hand side of the spectrum when you go to level uh, five, it's level six because it starts from zero to five, or you can just call it five, which is full autonomy, which means there is nobody, uh, there's no driver, they, the, even the actuators are, are sort of not necessary. And uh, uh, you are not just operating in one particular city or one particular area of a city, you can operate in any environment, urban or rural, on a freeway. Uh, and so, so that's really uh, what the goal is. And just to put things in perspective, because you know there's so much activity happening in this space, you know, it often people lose sight of why this is important. So I just want to remind you that millions of people they die every year uh, because of uh, accidents and vehicle crashes, and that can be prevented if the car uh, is uh, uh, you know autonomous. It doesn't suffer from the same fallacies of human drivers, such as distracted driving or drunken driving or driving under distress or uh, you know, just just not rested enough. So there's a lot of human human factor. In fact, 94% of all these crashes um, involve some kind of human error. And so if we can, you know, take care of the majority of these uh, human problems by making the software such that it doesn't make these mistakes, it's very challenging. But you know, if that can be done, then the potential impact on the number of lives that you can save uh, is is tremendous. And that's just you know the the primary benefit. The secondary benefits of uh, fully autonomous cars are uh, are also very very uh, uh, you know significant. Uh, millions of people again they have impaired vision or they're just too old to drive. And so you know there's a large population today which does not have access to driving that you and I maybe take for granted. Uh, and so this autonomous vehicles could be the transformation in mobility which is required for seniors and for people who have some kind of a, uh, impaired vision or other disability to, to be able to you know, um, experience the, the convenience of having to drive from point A to point B, which is uh, sort of a very thing that we all take for granted. Uh, and then there are even more tertiary uh, benefits in terms of you know, impact on the environment, on, on traffic congestion, on how cities are planned. Uh, and things like that. So, so, so the the list of uh, benefits to be obtained from autonomous vehicles is a, a long and glorious list. But to get there uh, is also a very treacherous path, and that's why we need smart people like you to understand this space, to understand how these cars work, and you know, uh, you are then going to become the future leaders uh, in the space, hopefully. Okay, so let's quickly jump into how uh, how a self-driving car works. Okay, a very quick quick idea. This is not in any way meant to be like a complete uh, uh, tutorial. 
But in a nutshell, any self-driving car out there, I don't care which brand, which prototype, it is always solving all these things that are listed here, right? So a car has to know where is it in the world, which is localization. Then it has to understand the world itself. So not only where am I in the world, but what are others around me? What are they up to? Where are they turning? How fast are they moving? And based on all of this scene understanding, uh, I can plan my own path, my own decisions in terms of what I have to do in the world and then just execute that plan, right? And then if you are somewhere in level two, level three, where this is partial autonomy, uh, you also have to monitor and take input from the human driver. So, so that also becomes another very important factor. And we do so by relying on a lot of different sensors. So here is just a generic image of uh, the kind of coverage that you can get from different kind of sensors. So you have radar, uh, which is long range, but uh, maybe not as high resolution as LIDAR. Uh, and then even LIDARs nowadays have different variety. You have actually rotating LIDARs or solid state LIDARs. And uh, we'll have a separate discussion on perception in detail later. Uh, you obviously have cameras, you have parking assist or ultrasonic medium range sensors. Uh, and then you have GPS, you have IMU, sometimes you have wheel encoders. So there's a lot of different data being generated. In fact, uh, it's estimated that a typical trip of a self-driving car for a couple of hours can generate terabytes uh, in terms of volumes of data, raw data alone. And so that alone is a big problem of how to store and find meaningful uh, instances from that data. But all that data is what is called the perception of the autonomous vehicle. It comes in from the cameras and the LIDAR and the radar in this, in this picture. It has to be processed. This process is called sensor fusion that you will learn about. And in a nutshell, all of this is uh, telling the car uh, answers to those questions of where, where am I and what are others around me uh, up to so that then I can plan my own motion in the world. Uh, so here's an ex interesting video. Someone a few years ago uh, sort of a reverse engineered uh, Tesla autopilot hardware to, uh, to produce this visual of uh, what it might be looking at. I say what it might be looking at is because this is kind of a hacking reverse engineering exercise. So we don't know exactly if this is what, uh, what the car sees, but it gives you a good idea of this uh, perception, right? So it's detecting objects, it's estimating their speeds, it's distinguishing between different types of objects, it's detecting lane boundaries, pedestrians, uh, it should be also maybe detecting traffic lights, but that's just not highlighted in the visualization. And then you can see this yellow path that it's uh, estimating I'm going to take, uh, you know, when it is my right of way. So, so that's what scene understanding and perception means. Here's another example that I really like. I have adapted these uh, these visuals from uh, Waymo's self-driving uh, uh, web page. Uh, and so this, this does a very good job of breaking down what a self-driving car has to do, right? So, so here's a, a typical scene. You are approaching uh, um, this uh, intersection and our ego vehicle, which is the white vehicle. Uh, by the way, uh, if you don't know this, in autonomous vehicles, when you discuss, it's typical to refer to your own vehicle as the ego vehicle, right? So when I use the term ego, uh, I'm just making sure you know what I'm referring to. So our ego vehicle approaches this intersection um, and you know, uh, it needs to know firstly, like where am I, right? And it relies on many, many different algorithms for that. Uh, it can rely on map information, like what is highlighted here. So the car knows what are lane markings, if this lane is left turn only, or what is the speed limit on the lane, where is the crossing and things like that. And it's using that information to figure out where it is in this, in this map or in this world. So that's part one. Then it has to detect what the world looks like, right? What are objects of interest? These are other vehicles. They are pedestrians, they are traffic lights. So it can detect all of that through its cameras, uh, through uh, semantic maps as well. So this is the answer of, you know, what is around me? But that's not enough, right? We can't just stop at, it's, this is not an object counting list of just looking at what is around me. You also have to figure out uh, what, these objects are intending to do. So what is like a prediction or estimation of their future motion? And I think that's one of the, the challenges in, in autonomous vehicles to, to do this uh, you know, estimation of other agents in terms of their speed, in terms of their trajectory, right? So you have to guess which cars are going to turn. So for example, it looks like there's some car which is going to make a left turn uh, and right is going to cross 
from your um, you know intended trajectory so you have to wait for either you have to wait for it to make the turn or you need to look at the uh, the traffic lights to figure out what is your right of way so you can see each object has been tagged with its its distance and it's also you know it's uh, estimated speed that it might take or, or is currently moving and the same is being done for pedestrians and cyclists and other objects of interest and so once you have all this information then you can plan you know your own path so you can say okay once the light turn greens and this vehicle has cleared i'm going to make sure i take this lane this is available for me and uh, uh, as long as it's safe and there's no other car or pedestrian impeding my progress i'm going to continue making that turn okay so this is a very very fast uh, overview but hopefully a intuitive overview of what an autonomous vehicle does uh, and how it works and really the idea of f110 is to go into detail of each one of those but in a fun and interesting manner right so so through f110 autonomous racing uh, typically we will build drive and race the car a physical car this semester the build part is going to be replaced by a simulator but you will still learn about the driving and the racing and in doing so really what you will learn about are these algorithms of perception planning control that are the same as they are on a full scale vehicle right so so uh, uh, you know, F1 by 10, it might be one tenth the scale, but it's 10 times the fun to, to work with this car, right? And that's where the name came from. It's Formula One, but by 10. All right, so let me now go into each of these three uh, kind of uh, pillars, the build, drive, and race part, just to give you a quick flavor of what to expect. Although we are not going to be physically building the car uh, in this semester, uh, it's still worthwhile to understand how the physical car works because the simulator is meant to you know replicate the reality of the actual actual build so this is the same picture as before uh, to show you what this car looks like um, i want to just convince you you know this car has a, a electric four wheel drive drivetrain uh, very similar to uh, you know what many modern day electric vehicles also have uh, and so it has similar dynamics uh, in terms of uh, braking and accelerating, but it has different different parameters, obviously, from the full-scale vehicle. And similarly, you know, it has the same sensors as you would find on a full-scale self-driving car prototype, but at a different scale, right? So our lidars cannot look 200 meters into um, uh, into in the front of them. We don't have radars on the F110 car, uh, but whatever we have is uh, uh, you know very powerful in terms of the 110 scale. So the base of the, the actual 110th vehicle is, uh, is just a RC remote controlled uh, chassis, a 110 scale rally car chassis from a vendor called Traxxas, but that's not something set in stone. You can use any, any 110th car that you find. Um, and so this is a very realistic car. This is not just a RC toy, it's a very fast car. It can actually go up to uh, 30 miles per hour by itself but with all the sensors and the weight of the battery and uh, and whatnot the, the top speed is limited to maybe 14 15 uh, miles per hour indoors which is extremely high for a car of uh, uh, a car of this size uh, so we use this 110th car and then let me just quickly tell you about some some basic basic uh, how do we actually convert this into uh, autonomous vehicle uh, so some some key hardware of interest is actually the brushless motor this is a, a very high speed uh, uh, Valenian uh, brushless DC motor. It can uh, go up to thousands of RPM in a flash with peak currents, uh, an amperage of uh, uh, dozens of amperes at, at peak kind of draw from the lithium ion battery. And so this powers all four wheels. This is a four wheel drive vehicle. Um, there is a electronic speed control on the car, but uh, you will see later that we actually replace the stock speed control with our own custom control, which offers us a lot of benefits in terms of uh, getting odometry data uh, from the car. Uh, then there is a servo motor for steering. This is vehicle has Ackerman steering. Don't worry if uh, that term doesn't ring a bell. I will explain later what Ackerman steering is. It's essentially this kind of steering used in real uh, vehicles. That can, steering is controlled by a single uh, high torque servo. Uh, there's a radio receiver because this is meant to be a RC toy. This is also something that we use to interface uh, with the car because um, we can just bypass the radio signal and directly uh, send our own signals to the vehicle. Uh, 
All of this is powered by its own battery pack. So we take this chassis and then basically we integrate a lot of different sensors on board. So these are LIDARs, cameras, you know, just a while ago I showed you real car sensors. So we have a version of that uh, for our own one tenth car as well. Uh, of course, all these sensors can just be directly hooked up to any of the electronics on board. So we need an um, uh, onboard computer. Uh, traditionally, we have been relying on the NVIDIA Jetson series of uh, embedded computers because uh, they're very powerful and they have GPUs on them so they can run some heavy duty computation stuff when it comes to localization and mapping. Um, like I said earlier, we replace the stock electronic speed control with our own custom motor controller. Uh, which is actually borrowed from the world of electric skateboards. So it's able to very precisely control the, the brushless DC motor. And every car has its own Wi-Fi uh, telemetry uh, antenna as well. So it can broadcast data uh, in real time to a remote machine for visualization and debugging. So overall, you know, uh, um, the basic version of this car, it's roughly around $2,700. It's uh, I know it's on the higher side for a one-tenth scale vehicle, but you know, considering its capabilities, uh, it's, uh, it is reasonable. The reason why this cost is very high because about half of this comes from the, the LiDAR. Right? So we, in the perception part of this uh, course, I will talk about LiDARs in detail, uh, but uh, the, the quick summary is that Two things govern the cost of LiDARs, how far you can look and how fast you can get data. And so we use a, a good trade-off and it can be made cheaper than 2,700, but that's the one that we use uh, in the course when we work with the real cars. Uh, and the good part about the build is it's completely open source. So anyone can print um, these chassis. These are like IKEA style instructions. You can laser cut ABS grade uh, plastic um, and essentially fit them together with step-by-step -step instructions on how and where to mount uh, every single sensor. In fact, let me play a, a brief video which will show you uh, a time-lapse of how this, uh, this car is assembled. Yeah, so the, the build keeps improving every year. This video is also several years old. This was one of our first builds. And uh, therefore you see a lot of wiring and looks pretty complicated, but uh, the cars that we have in our labs, they have much, much simplified, a lot less components as well. Uh, and so the build is much, much simpler. Uh, so as I said earlier, you know, we use a, a electro custom electronic speed controller and so um, the idea is that speed controller can directly control the, uh, the motor and the servo uh, very precisely using a proportional integral derivative control that you will also learn about. But well, let me play this video, it'll give you some sense of what we can do with this speed controller. Yeah, so you can really see how quickly and easily we can ramp up to uh, uh, to very, very high RPM. And, you know, if, if those wheels were touching the table, the car would just fly off and uh, uh, essentially destroy itself. And so not only can we do this for the drive uh, with the VSC, we can also, you know, do this for the steering. So you can see the servo is getting controlled uh, and you can control the steering angle very, very precisely. Okay, so that was a quick glimpse of the build part. Let's jump into the drive part, right? So how, how do we actually do perception planning control uh, on this vehicle? So this is really where, where I think a lot of the time in this course is going to be spent. Uh, I really think that uh, the way we train uh, students for uh, learning about autonomy has not really, hasn't really changed in the last uh, decade or so. So, you know, courses like this and this exercise of learning how a 110 scale car works, uh, it really kind of, you know, is, a, is a pushing the envelope a little bit in terms of how you educate autonomous systems engineers for the future. So in the future, I think, you know, autonomous racing teams will look a lot, a lot, a lot like this, where you don't just have the mechanical guys and the, 
uh, you know, mechatronics uh, uh, people on the team, but you have uh, uh, computer scientists and systems engineers who are responsible for control, nav, perception, mapping. And this is already happening at scale, as you will find out you know, by the end of this lecture. So in terms of drive, the main emphasis I have said before is going to be in teaching robot operating system, which is the, um, the most popular and standardized way to uh, program a robot, not just a self-driving car, but any robot. Uh, it is not a real operating system, but it's like a you know, set of libraries and codes uh, that you can uh, run on any other operating system. So ROS provides us a way to implement these different blocks uh, which are required for the car to function uh, by reusing many of the existing code. So you don't have to write drivers for all these different sensors. Uh, and then you also have code for motion planning, for mapping and things like that. So it makes your life very, very easy. It's a very powerful tool, very popular tool. Uh, in this course, we will first focus on learning ROS1 and then later we'll touch upon learning ROS2. And you'll learn more about ROS1 and ROS2 in uh, the very next lecture actually, which is going to be introduction to ROS. Uh, and we'll also, doing so, learn a lot about the tools. ROS provides a bunch of different tools like RQT graph, visualization tools, simulation tools. I already showed you an example of Gazebo as being one of those tools. And so you will get exposed to the entire world, wonderful world, I might add, of ROS. And we'll go deep into you know how, uh, how ROS works, how sensors exchange data, how do you build maps, uh, what do you do with data, how do you make sure data is received on time, uh, and so, so we'll go deep into ROS. That's why the first kind of uh, uh, few weeks are focused on learning and teaching ROS because that will form the backbone of uh, implementing everything else. Um, so let me play a couple of uh, highlight videos from recent years of this course itself. That will give you a very good idea of uh, in a time when we were allowed to gather in large groups, how was this course uh, organized and what kind of uh, you know autonomous racing we accomplished? So let me play those videos for you. All right, so now we come to the, the last part, which is focusing on the racing part, right? So, so uh, this is not just an autonomous vehicles course, it's very intentionally designed to be a racing course, and I'll explain why. And so the whole idea of racing is that all teams will have similar cars, and they will have the same perception, the same capability, 
And so really what it then boils down to is that racing is nothing but a, but a battle of algorithms, right? So if, if you don't have a competition of who can buy the most expensive motor or, you know, in the simulator, it's even um, difficult to gain any advantage in terms of vehicle dynamics or the capability of the vehicle. So you are only uh, hope and resort to uh, uh, overtake and outshine your opponent is through the better racing algorithm. And that's really what we'll focus on too. Because racing, you know, will force your hand to combine crazy ideas from perception, planning, control uh, to outsmart your opponents. Um, so just for some context, we've been doing this for many, many years, just not at UVA, but outside. I'm one of the organizers of the F110 International Autonomous Racing uh, Competitions. And uh, even though you can see some of these images are from as recent as uh, 2019, it just seems like this was uh, in a different lifetime because we have you know, the world has experienced a really, really massive change from, from that time till date. And hopefully, you know, we can, I can't wait to go forward to a time where we could uh, uh, gather in person and have one of these races again. So I have again, a couple of videos to show you. One thing that you will have to get used to in this course is I will show you a lot of, lot of videos. So um, don't skip forward. You can, they are usually very well edited. So uh, let me show you some highlights from one of our racing events. <music> So that was the uh, uh, highlights of a race that we held in uh, in Italy. Um, now here's another video. Here you can see um, and get a sense for how fast this car is. So you can get, get a real time sense. This is not sped up or, or tweaked in any manner. This is the real speed of the car. And actually, you'll see it. It turns so fast that the wheels sometimes lift off the ground. <laughs> so that, you know uh, that's kind of the limits of it's hitting the limits of traction and speed and control, which is really exciting. Uh, here is another video of uh, a multi-agent race. This is a very challenging problem, and so what you are seeing is probably world's first overtake, which happened a couple of years ago. Fully autonomous overtake. You have two cars. Both of them are fully autonomous. They are using different approaches. Doesn't really matter. And this car is pursuing the car in front. It has a, uh, a speed gain. It almost touches the other car. But as you see, it comes around the corner. The car, which is on the inside line, is going to overtake uh, just on the basis of its line and, uh, and be able to avoid a collision at such a high speed. So, uh, so that's sort of you know, what, what we are used to in the F110 world. And we will try our best to replicate that uh, into the simulation this semester. So that was build drive control. Let's quickly jump into how that maps to perception planning and, con sorry, that was build drive and race. Let's now talk about how it maps into perception planning and control, specifically this time to uh, F110. All right, so, so, so as said earlier, no matter what car you have, perception means you have to make sense of your surroundings. 
Uh, then you have to plan a path in the context of racing that might be a race line or some overtaking line that you have planning in real time. And then you have to execute the commands to follow your plan, right? So uh, it's no good competing the race line if you can't control your acceleration and steering to maintain your heading on that line. And so, so you have to continuously you know, close the loop from perception, planning, and control, or sensing, planning, and action, uh, which is exactly what a full-scale car also does, right? So in that sense, F110 is uh, exactly the same. Um, the, the challenge of racing is that because of the speed of the car, uh, you have to do this very, very fast, right? You have to close the loop very fast. So if you fail to, if you spend too much time uh, planning or you don't get uh, fresh data because of your speed, because of the, through the sensing, it's very likely that, that you will crash, right? So, so uh, it makes the, the closing the loop problem more resource constrained, if you will. And so we look into you know the different architectures and different portions uh, in this uh, um, in this course, which will walk you through the different approaches in ROS on how to solve the perception planning and control problem. So here's a very quick glimpse at it. I won't go into uh, too many details right now. Uh, for perception, our real vehicles use a 2D uh, lidar, right? So in in the real uh, uh, full scale autonomous vehicles, the lidar is three dimensional, so it can uh, sweep 360 and it can also has a vertical dimension to it. So it's not just like a, a, a 2D map, but the, the, the LIDARs that we use on our F110 vehicles, they are 2D uh, laser scanning LIDARs from Hokuyo. And uh, what, what this picture shows is the uh, physical location of the car is, is, is in, in this corridor. And then on the right hand side, you can see the white dots are actually the uh, the point cloud or the LIDAR scans returned uh, when the car was placed in, in this uh, uh, position. And actually the tool you are seeing on the right to visualize this LIDAR scan is called RVIS. Or it's a ROS visualization tool that you will uh, uh, know like the back of your hand by the time we are done with this course. So we'll you know get, get into how, how to parse this data, how to use it. Um, also, we'll do a, a deep dive into uh, transformations, right? So I said earlier, uh, you need to know your matrix transformations and algebra and calculus. Well, this is one example of why you might uh, need to know them. So, so, so if, you, if you think about the previous picture, the scan that you get is from the perspective of the LIDAR or the sensors frame, right? So, so in, in, this, in this picture right here, you can say the laser uh, is in up front and we are looking at the data from the point of view of the laser. But the laser is not the representative of the entire geometry of the car. So there needs to be a transformation between the data we get, which is with respect to where the LIDAR is located, and maybe you know with respect to the center of gravity, how, how does that look? So we need to transform that data, and that's why uh, we will learn about pose representations and transformations. Uh, you will get into coordinate frames, how to transform data between one frame to the other. Uh, of interest specifically is the map frame, because as the name implies, you know that's the origin of the map that you will build using these uh, LIDAR scans. Right, so this is uh, another example of what you would typically get from, from the LIDAR. So let's see how you can use this LIDAR scan and build a map from it, right? So I'm just going to give you a high level intuition right now. And that brings us to the, the middle part of mapping, localization, and, and path planning, uh, where the idea is that you know we want to build a map, we want to figure out where we are in the map, and then you want to figure out our trajectory or motion uh, in the world or the map itself. So, so what mapping helps you do is it takes your perception, which in this case is just a LIDAR. I'm simplifying the problem. I'm not showing you G uh, IMU or, or camera data right now. But we can take this uh, LIDAR scan and we can convert it into the uh, this kind of a 2D occupancy map uh, of the world. So it's the same scan. It's just now being visualized in a manner that uh, you can begin thinking of this as a two-dimensional map. So here's another example that will make it clear. Uh, so if you were sitting on top of the LIDAR, this is what you would see, right? So, so from your vantage point, the world moves around you and you continuously get new 2D LIDAR scans as you move in this hallway. This is what the car sees or what, what the sensor sees. And what mapping algorithms do is they can ingest this data and transform it to 
the movement of the car because that's what's actually happening in the real world, right? So if we keep track of where the car is with respect to the origin, we can use the same LiDAR scan to build and infer this two-dimensional map of the world, right? So here's a, here's a much more uh, uh, deeper explanation of it. So, so you can see in this video, uh, we have a corridor and the car actually is being manually driven in this case in this corridor. As it navigates or is driven, um, more and more parts of this hallway, they come into the field of view of the LiDAR. And so we are processing that data in a method using simultaneous localization and mapping or SLAM. Some of you may have heard of it. And then, you know, this is the output of the SLAM. We are building this uh, two dimensional occupancy grid map of the world using this data from, from the LiDAR. And so uh, in this course, you know, you will learn about this process and you will do this process in the simulator as well. So once you have the plan, uh, you have the map, you have to solve two problems. You have to locate where you are in the map. And then when you plan a path, you have to follow that path, right? So let's talk about the second problem first, which is the problem of control. So in this course, you will learn about different types of control, reactive control, predictive control, but you will also learn about very simple form of a controller called a PID or a proportional integral derivative controller. Uh, so, you know, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is probably worth even more. Uh, so here you show a center line, which is what the car has been asked to follow. And if you have a well-tuned PID controller, you can see more or less how it maintains that line. I know the video warps a little, but that just be to correct the camera shake. Uh, so the car is able to maintain its uh, true heading, which is it's being asked to basically be at the center of the two walls. And so you need a well-tuned PID for that to occur. If your PID is not well-tuned, you can see it oscillates about before it will eventually converge very you know, sluggishly onto that line, right? So, so you will learn about uh, how these gains affect the behavior of the car. And finally, like I said, you know, you have to, given the map, you need to localize yourself within the map, and that's what's been shown here. So previously, I showed you how we build this hallway map. This time, the car is not manual, it is in autonomous mode. And what you are seeing on the right-hand side with this blue, green, and red arrow is an algorithm called uh, AMCL, or Adaptive Monte Carlo Localization, where we are using a particle filter to estimate where we are in the map. And then the car is able to you know, uh, drive autonomously. So I will teach you about not just how maps are built, but once you have the map of the environment, how do you figure out where you are in that world for you to make progress towards your goal or your race line? All right, so, so talking about racing, um, there are many approaches. The easiest one is if you have a LiDAR, uh, you can just drive around the track by measuring walls, right? That's why you see on the right-hand side, the track itself is deliberately designed so it has some minimum height, which is greater than the height of the LiDAR, so that the LiDAR can get a sense for the width of the track in runtime, right? So what you are basically doing is you are minimizing some kind of cross-track error and uh, uh, using that to figure out when to slow down, when to brake, and when to turn. So let's take a quick peek at this. Once again, the car is pretty fast. And there's some public service announcement over there. Okay, here's another example of using similar ideas, but in a much more advanced manner. So I will teach you about an algorithm called follow the gap, uh, which as you just saw, this this is not moving that fast because the the uh, there are a lot of obstacles, but it's seamlessly figuring out how to find its way around obstacles, uh, even though you know the gap is just barely enough for the car to pass through it. You can see again how it goes through and threads the needle when it goes through these gaps. Right, so we learn about these obstacle avoidance using LiDAR as a primary sensor. And you put all of this together, uh, here is highlights of uh, one of the racing formats. So what you see on the right is this kind of wall following or reactive method. It's reactive because to make your decision, you are relying on instant measurements of your sensor. There is no prediction of any kind involved. Uh, and so, you know, in one of our races, you had to go around, set the fastest lap, 
Uh, these are highlights from the winning team at the Cyber Physical Systems race that we held in Portugal uh, a couple of years ago. And then there's penalties for, for crashing into the barrier and, and things like that. And there's a timing system which automatically calculates uh, the lap time. So we'll try to replicate this in our simulator as well. And you know this is reactive, but we will go into more advanced motion planning as well in this course, uh, where the idea is you know you are looking at uh, going from point A to point B, and uh, in many of these cases, all these obstacles are static. I haven't shown you a video yet where there are other cars as well. I think I showed you one just a, a while ago, but not in the context of a trajectory planning. So we'll go over a list of uh, you know many different uh, motion planning and dynamic and static collision avoidance algorithms as well. Of course, when you race head to head, there's an element of uh, a pose detection and estimation, just like I showed you Waymo has to detect the estimate, the speed and the trajectory of other cars. Um, F110 also has to do that. So here is an example of how you might do that uh, with a camera. So every car has this uh, license plate or a April tag or a fiducial marker behind it. And um, it has a very unique pattern that uh, object detection camera can pick very, very easily and then figure out the pose and the distance of the car, which you can derivate to, uh, to derive the estimated speed of the car or the relative speed of the car. Continuing along this path, you can also go into deep learning. So here's an example of uh, using end-to-end -end, uh, behavioral cloning for driving. So what you are seeing here is, uh, a car was being driven around the lap. I'll actually show you how this data was collected as well. Uh, and then we trained a network to learn how to steer around this track based on this uh, demonstration by an expert. So what you see is the, the predicted steering angle and how it compares to what the expert did, which shows you essentially that you can in principle learn how to drive just by um, building this deep neural network from pixels to trajectory. So in a nutshell, you know, uh, there's a lot of interesting examples. I've only shown you a very selective assortment of uh, some key ideas. Uh, and you know, the emphasis of this slide is on your project, right? So, so you and your team uh, can help contribute to the F110 community and do a mini project of its own. Most likely that project will have to do with involving the simulator this year. But again, we have very creative ideas and you can come up with your own ideas as well. Um, to, to propose an interesting uh, addition to, to simulation, whether that's uh, in any of these existing areas or something that we haven't even thought about. So speaking of the simulator, let me play uh, another video of uh, what the simulator looks like. And in a sense, this video is going to give you a summary of everything I have talked so far in the real car can be done in the simulator. So. Uh, why don't I go ahead and play this video and then we can continue. All right, so that was the, the simulator video. We'll use some version of that in the course, uh, not from day one. So right now, don't worry about installing the simulator. Uh, you just need to install Ubuntu, and then uh, we'll actually walk you through how to install ROS as well. Okay, so we are getting close to the end of this first overview. I just have two more topics to touch. Uh, the first is I want to give you a firsthand feel of why we care about racing. So it's cool, it's fast, it's exciting. It's a great tool for education, but it's also very important for research. It actually solves a real world problem. So very quickly, let me give you, again, a high level summary of a very interesting problem that lends itself towards advances in racing. Okay, so a while ago I showed you this exact slide. I'm gonna not repeat all these different uh, aspects that a self-driving car has to solve. What is worth noting here is that many of these are now being done using machine learning based approaches or data driven and deep neural network approaches. 
uh, especially a lot of the perception is being done using deep learning, right? So about six or five years ago, uh, one would say that uh, most of the code on the car was uh, hard-coded in form of expert systems. So these are rules of, you know, here's how traffic should work, this is what to do in the speed limit, this is, so these are, you know, traditional, maybe even computer vision methods, but but then we really latched on to the advances in pattern recognition and computer vision, and today's perception stack looks more like this, right? So the, the kind of stuff which is being used for uh, or being solved and addressed by deep learning has, has really grown. So uh, beyond just simple 2D object detection, right? So you can do scene understanding, optical flow, tracking, and a lot of these estimation of other vehicles are routinely done using deep neural networks. In some cases, even the planning and control is being done with deep neural networks. So that's not a hypothesis. This is happening. It's real. Uh, here are some examples of end-to-end, uh, -end fully drivable networks, which goes from uh, pixels all the way to control or pixels to trajectory. And so, uh, very quickly, you know, the the reason I brought this up is that because we all know the the machine learning itself is very brittle because it's so data dependent and. And that can be the cause of many problems, uh, especially when you know you are using it in a safety critical system. Uh, so here are some some problems. So here is a cherry picked, exaggerated, I must admit, problem, where you have a sticker behind a, a car, and the sticker itself has other uh, you know traffic related objects on it. So if you are a self driving car, uh, you may detect objects, but they are not really there. They're just a sticker. And uh, maybe this is not a real problem because you can rely on radar and other sensors to figure out that all of this is really just one object, uh, but something to think about, right? Similarly, uh, if you are a computer vision algorithm, uh, what do you do when you see this on the road, right? Do you classify this as one car or multiple cars? So you need, we need to, you know, computers are very literal, so we need to tell them that in situations such as this, it is a single car. And uh, the problem is there are many, many such situations and they're possibly uncountable uh, infinite situations. And once again, this is not you know, all made up and uh, you know, just for the sake of shock and awe. Uh, you can see here a self-driving car prototype, um, and it is in self-driving mode, as the video indicates, and then you know, for some reason it just uh, decides that oh, uh, there's a gap between me and the car. Doesn't maybe detect a truck. I'm just speculating, I don't know if that's the case. Uh, if you are again a computer vision algorithm and uh, you're driving and this is what you see, uh, you might be inclined to uh, to make a very aggressive evasive maneuver because you have to avoid this head-on collision. Uh, and uh, in a morbid sense, this is maybe the last thing you see, but actually there's no cause for an alarm, right? Because this truck is actually getting towed away from you. And so it's just another vehicle. It's just that it appears in a manner that usually vehicles don't appear. So, so these things could be confusing. Uh, this is one of my favorites. There's a, a ramen noodle place whose logo looks like a do not enter a street sign. And so, you know, here's an example of a self-driving car prototype, which gets confused that the street or the intersection is do not enter uh, because of these advertisements. And uh, admittedly, you know, you can solve this by, by using semantic maps and, and other things, but uh, just wanted to show an interesting edge case. Uh, here's a car which is complaining that you are too close to a bus, but you are just parked in your garage. And maybe the, the, the doors of the washer and the dryer kind of maybe look like the, the wheels of the bus, I'm guessing. Uh, what do you do for this, right? You need a, a plan B or you need a way to clean your cameras and your perception sensors because the real world is messy and this is just one example of the kind of messiness you have to deal with when you drive. And uh, I don't even want to explain or comment <laughs> what is going on here, um, uh, but you can see this is what I do, right? I, I spend time on the internet to find all these, uh, all these edge cases for you. So somebody modified their truck so that it looks like it's being driven in reverse, but it's actually, being driven in the right direction. So, so we have to account for this because it exists. So there are many, many such examples. Uh, and the idea is that you know, the real world is very messy and we're relying on these deep neural networks uh, can be both, uh, uh, it has its both its pros and cons. And so we need to be mindful of that, right? So here's a very alarming example of what could go wrong very, very quickly and very badly. Uh, here, I won't even tell you what the problem is, but let me just give you a hint that you're already in autonomous mode and you are entering this tunnel and then something very interesting happens uh, as you enter the tunnel. 
did you see it already happened so it was very very subtle you may want to go back and check again but what was happening is that as you entered the tunnel maybe i can just replay it one more time so this time as you enter the tunnel pay attention to how the sunlight is creating a virtual dummy lane or lane markings on the left hand side which makes the card think there's a lane and it swerves right because it detects a lane marking created by sunlight and the driver had to take control and uh, you know, bring it back into the original lane. So who would have thought of that when coding this deep neural network or lane detection? So these are, you know, the problem really is how can we ensure that these vehicles always drive safely when they encounter situations which don't typically happen frequently uh, in traffic? And so many of those examples, uh, you know, you can be fixed uh, using uh, uh, techniques in computer vision and sensor fusion. Uh, we are more really interested in dynamic maneuvers, right? Not so much in failures in perception, but uh, but failures in motion prediction, right? So so here you are driving in your lane, and then you see the brake lights come out, and there's somebody parked, right? So your car has to know to swerve around and come to a safe stop. Um, again, this is very unusual, but your self-driving car has to deal with that spinning vehicle in the middle of a freeway. Uh, yeah, the longer this video goes, the, the more uh, scary these scenarios become, but somebody's just driving in your lane, people routinely cut in front of you, your car has to be able to detect all of these things. So these are not failures in perception, they are maybe failures in state estimation, right? It's your right of way, but somebody decides not today, right? So they just cut you off on the green light. And so, so, so we want to teach autonomous vehicles to be able to maneuver aggressively uh, when it matters most, when they encounter these dynamic situations. Uh, at this point, I would say you shouldn't even be driving, but uh, yeah, your self-driving car has to be able to deal with it in case, uh, or, or maybe it shouldn't allow you to be on the road uh, when conditions are such adverse. So uh, very quickly, the idea that we have uh, been investigating in our own research is what is called safety through agility. And in a nutshell, the idea is that if you have two vehicles which are exactly the same, then the one which is more agile is technically more safer. It can deal with these edge cases and dynamic situations uh, much better. So, so the question becomes, how do you make these vehicles agile? And the answer is that we teach vehicles to be agile by autonomously uh, racing them against each other at high speeds, right? Because racing by design uh, presents these high speed close, prox close proximity situations. And so, so uh, if we can teach our car to act like expert drivers, now uh, guaranteed these cars are also special and not like commercial vehicles, but that's not what is of interest. What is of interest is how do these drivers get so good at maneuvering, estimating other drivers' position uh, in this very unstructured kind of traffic, right? So that's really what we want to learn. Uh, simply put, you know, there's a saying in, uh, in motorsport racing that if everything seems under control, then you are not going fast enough. And, and uh, my group and my students, uh, we are essentially designing a, a autonomous racing AI with this as its objective function. So just quickly to give you some more intuition that we encounter more frequent close proximity high speed situations in racing. So it's a good test bed to learn agile behavior. Um, so that's one aspect of racing. Uh, what you may want to know is in, in my lab, we, we routinely use uh, games, uh, realistic photorealistic games to train our AI, right? So, so uh, here's a side-by-side -side example of a real world Formula One footage and one from uh, 2019 Formula One official game. And if it wasn't for, uh, if it wasn't for the, for the labels on the top, it would be very difficult to even distinguish which is real and which is uh, uh, the game, right? So we are using decades of advances in computer graphics, in, uh, in photorealism, in high fidelity physics modeling. We don't want to reinvent that wheel, but essentially what we have done is we have converted this game into a simulator and as a sandbox for us to develop these uh, AI algorithms for autonomous racing. So uh, no points for guessing what's next. I'm going to play another video. I'm going to play another video of uh, a, a brief three minute video of the summary of this very exciting project called Deep Racing. Uh, and so let me play that for you. Formula One is considered as one of the pinnacles of motorsport racing. 
the expert drivers have split-second reaction times and routinely drive with the limits of control under high-speed and close proximity situations, which occur frequently during a race. Although racing on an F1 track is different than driving on a freeway or in a city, learning to race autonomously in such dynamic and extreme environments has the potential to train agile controllers, which can handle unexpected traffic situations by maneuvering in an aggressive and agile manner when it matters most. We present Deep Racing AI, a framework to develop algorithms for autonomous Formula One racing. This is the first work that has converted the high fidelity and photorealistic official F1 game from Codemasters into a simulation testbed. The game is so realistic that it was used by real F1 drivers for competitive online racing during the COVID-19 lockdown. Our Deep Racing API can read game state information and tag images from the game with that data in a format suitable for deep learning. It can also send steering and acceleration back to the game to autonomously control the race car. We then implement and compare different autonomous racing algorithms. Starting with pixels to control, an end-to-end -end approach which directly predicts steering and acceleration commands from each image. As can be seen, this approach is brittle and the car crashes almost immediately after the start. This behavior can be improved using LSTM cells to include a history of image sequences, but this network also struggles to keep the car on the track as can be seen here. Instead of directly predicting control values, we next build a planner that predicts waypoints for the race car's trajectory. A pure pursuit controller is used to follow these waypoints. This performs much better than previous approaches, but can lead to undesired behavior during sharp turns, such as corner cutting and exceeding track limits. Finally, we use a novel approach where instead of predicting the waypoints individually, we instead predict the control points for a Bezier curve for the race car's trajectory. This reduces the dimensionality of our problem and also makes the trajectories contiguous and smooth, resulting in the best overall autonomous racing performance. Here you can see a side-by-side -side view of the predicted Bezier curve and the image sequences during an autonomous lap at the Albert Park circuit in Australia. This approach outperforms all previous methods in terms of lap time, speed, and the number of failures where the car partially exceeds track limits. We also implement and test our method on data obtained from the F110 autonomous racing testbed. The performance on the F110 car can be seen here. We are continuing to extend our methods to the challenging case of multi-agent autonomous Formula One racing. You can see our deep racing AI trying to fight its way through high speed traffic when collision damage is switched off in the game. Deep racing will help in making progress towards building the foundations of safety through agility for autonomous vehicles. So how does F110 fit into the scheme? So here you see uh, uh, one of your TAs, Varun Dev, he's uh, driving this car, uh, very similar to how you drive it in the game. So essentially he's playing the game, but on a real car with this first person view headset. So this is what he sees as the car is being driven around uh, in the track. And as he is driving in the track using ROS, we can log all the data, the LiDAR, the camera, the accelerator, all the data from the car, the pose, the trajectory. So now you see two cars. One is the manual car or the first person view and another autonomous car has been just programmed to follow the wall. And so what, what he's trying to do now is overtake this autonomous mule car and create you know, examples of overtaking and passing so we can observe that through the data sets. And so, so, so we can do that in our, in our lab, we can do manual mode, autonomous mode, um, and so you can go to deepracing.ai to learn more as well. But when you bring all of this together, now you have two F110 vehicles and both are autonomous and one has just learned uh, how to overtake the other, right? So, so through that example. So this is just, you know, one of those ways in which we are using it uh, for research. There's, there's many, many other uh, ongoing research projects as well.
finally, I promise you it's, uh, it's one tenth the scale, but 10 times the fun. Uh, for us behind the scenes, the fun is in organizing and building cars and making this material, making setting up the labs, uh, filming videos of our demos. Uh, in our research, we have fun of different kinds. I told you a while ago, if everything seems under control, then you're not going fast enough. Let me show you a brief glimpse of what that means. <laughs> Wow, so you saw that car again routinely lifting off the grounds um, and that doesn't happen, right? So you, that's really evidence of reaching the limits of control. Uh, finally, the last piece I want to discuss today is this is again a very exciting time to be interested in autonomous racing. Uh, I'm very pleased in a, in a lot of sense because I was involved in the very beginning of F110 um, and now it has come to a point where uh, people are thinking about full-scale autonomous racing. So you have full-scale 200 miles per hour uh, race cars like Formula One and Indy, uh, which would be fully autonomous, right? So we are also part of this Indy autonomous racing challenge that I'll tell you about in just a second. So at UVA, there's lots going on. It's a great time to be uh, involved in autonomous racing. Um, I'm the team principal of a student organization called Cavalier Autonomous Racing, and we are a essentially a competitive racing team which uh, represents our university's colors and you can learn more about us uh, if you go to autonomousracing.dev uh, actually one of the easiest and the best ways to get uh, your foot into autonomous racing uh, at UVA is to just take this course do well and then you will have no trouble in being part of this team uh, we are a competitive team we race at every scale at every speed uh, uh, in F110, you already know I, have a, I was involved in organizing many of these uh, competitions myself, but we've also participated uh, as teams uh, in many of these competitions, and some of which in recent years have been online. Uh, in addition to the F110 competitions uh, at UVA, we are also in the midst of putting together uh, an actual electric go-kart, a uh, fully autonomous electric go-kart. We have all the parts and uh, right now, due to COVID restrictions, very selective students are allowed to, to work on it with the, uh, under very high supervision and guidelines, uh, research guidelines. But we, we are planning on expanding that um, you know, as it becomes safer to do so. But this is on the calendar. It's on one of the things that uh, Cavalier Autonomous Racing will do. Uh, we'll go from one-tenth scale to full-scale autonomous go-karts, right? So it doesn't get uh, any better than that. And so now our sensors also become more real-world rather than these 2D LIDARs. We'll use actual LIDARs and radars and GPS. And finally, Cavalier Autonomous Racing is also part of the Indy Autonomous Challenge, which is uh, a historic race in many ways uh, where uh, more than two dozen teams are going to compete for a million dollar prize uh, to race this actual vehicle. This is not a, a computer graphic. This is the actual uh, uh, photograph of a vehicle at the famous uh, Indianapolis Motorsport Speedway. Uh, and uh, our team hopes to get access to this vehicle uh, in summer this year and work on uh, getting it onto the track. We've already been doing it in simulation. So uh, I'll play a bunch of videos. The first one would be to show what this challenge is about. And then I will have two more videos to show how we are using simulation uh, in order to make progress and prepare ourselves for the real car.
Yeah, so as you saw, you know, uh, we've been routinely participating in these uh, virtual hackathons with head-to-head -head racing. Uh, we use this uh, very elaborate simulator from, uh, from ANSYS called VR Experience, uh, in which the vehicle is modeled and uh, you can have a head-to-head -head race and try out all these algorithms. So our experience with F110 is kind of now being translated into, uh, into the simulator. All right, so this is a great, great opportunity again to, to be part of this uh, university-wide effort. This is not just a C's thing, it's open to anybody in the university. Uh, and you know you, you, uh, you can get involved and you'll have a chance to, uh, in, the, in the Indie Challenge specifically, um, to routinely work with technologies which are very relevant uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. So if you are planning to you know, work in this area, uh, having these skill sets underneath your belt are, are going to go a long way. Talking about skill sets, this is kind of you know the idea of Cavalier Autonomous Racing to to bring together. It's essentially an extension of the F110 community at UVA. I'm uh, very excited about about this uh, student club. I hope more and more students can make time uh, to be involved. It is at the end of the day, uh, you know, all we are asking for is your time. Yeah, so do check it out. Um, so that's mostly it in terms of the the course overview. I hope I have answered uh, all your questions of what to expect from the course and uh, uh, you know what are the prerequisites, what we plan to cover, uh, what is the grading criteria, um, and in general, you know what is F110, what is perception planning control, and what you can expect to take away uh, from this course as well. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I will conclude this lecture with uh, one more video. Let me play that for you. So that's it, folks. Um, this was the course introduction for uh, this year's offering of the F110 Autonomous Racing course. I look forward to meeting you uh, online, uh, which reminds me, I forgot to mention this. Uh, although this is online asynchronous, the office hours will be online. I should have included it in the earlier part of the lecture, but if you stuck with this video for so long, now you know that there will be some face-to-face -face interaction as well. I'd like to get to know my students too. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll do my best to accommodate your request and answer your concerns. Um, other than that, this is mostly a wrap of the introduction of F110. I'm very excited, like I said earlier, to uh, introduce all this material to you, to change it from recent years, one of the biggest changes being that we will be using a simulator, which in some phase is good because everybody can get their own virtual car, at least to begin with. Uh, but also I do uh, you know, uh, acknowledge that uh, we will not be having that aspect of working physically on the car. But hey, if you do well in this course, many students traditionally have gone on to be, do research in my group as well. Uh, and so, so who knows, that opportunity might come up uh, in summer as well. So with that, I will end this uh, introductory lecture and I will see you in the next lecture when we will dive deep into the world of Ross. Take care and I'll see you next time.